Let us pray. Gracious God, your vision of peace and wholeness comes to us in sweeping revelations and in tiny signs of hope. Kindle our hearts that we might be a hopeful people. Keep us from growing weary of waiting so that we do not miss the glory of your appearing. Even so, come quickly, O God. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 through 16. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The epistle reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourself and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that that day catch you unexpectedly like a trap for it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This past week, the Presbyterian Outlook, which is the magazine for our denomination, ran a series of articles all written from uh, members of a group that has titled itself The Sisterhood of the Traveling Robe. The Traveling Robe started when Pastor Mary Kathleen Duncan started to find that her more fitted robe was a little too tight and getting tighter around the tummy. A friend of hers had a spare Geneva robe that's like the one I have here. It's very roomy. And so this friend boxed up that robe and mailed it to Mary Kathleen to wear for the next few months, as long as she needed. And then when Mary Kathleen no longer needed that robe, she found out about another pastor in need of a more roomy robe and sent it along. It seems appropriate that leading up to this first Sunday of Advent, the Presbyterian Outlook decided to dedicate some space 
to this very unique experience of preaching while pregnant. What better symbol of expectation, of waiting, of hope? Finding out about this sisterhood, various other pastors have chimed into the conversation. Under postings of these articles, people have written requests for the robe to travel their way. Uh, they've announced that they too will be needing that robe or that they uh, already need it. One wrote that she would like the robe too, someday. They were trying, they were longing, they were hoping, someday. Uh, Hugh, my four-year-old, recently declared to his father and to me that he'd figured out that someday, he said, I know what someday means, someday means never. <laughs> like, oh, sorry. <laughs> someday, Hugh. <laughs> someday. Over Thanksgiving, I had a conversation with a couple who are early in their pregnancy, another one. Usually such news would induce cheers of excitement and anticipation, but we knew to be cautious. There have already been so many disappointments. The couple exchanged different timelines for when they would be able to breathe again. Maybe after the 10-week check, we'll get excited, or after that first ultrasound, maybe after 23 weeks, maybe after the birth itself, hoping in the meantime, will be dangerous. Emily Dickinson describes hope as the thing with feathers that perches on the soul. But sometimes we know, instead, hope is the thing locked tightly in the heart, too dangerous to let fly, too risky to unleash on an already bruised life. Jesus paints a vivid picture in today's Luke passage. The world, he says, will be bruised. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the earth distress among nations. Confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves, people will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. I've never been particularly partial to this passage or to Jesus' apocalyptic imagery. Now, perhaps you feel the same way. It's easy to get caught up in these preliminary verses and be feel, filled with dread. But then I tend to imagine what things will feel like when this happens, right? I, I imagine what it would be like to read the newspaper every day and be filled with dread to see a constant rotation of natural disasters and apathy and abuse and fear-mongering and pettiness. I imagine what it will be like to be confused by the world around me and afraid for the future. I imagine that and I think, wait a second, I don't have to imagine that. I know what that feels like. Anyone else? Listen, I don't want to overplay the challenges of our day and age. I am hardly the first to link contemporary headlines to Jesus' description here. Every generation has offered a prediction of impending end times doom. And to be clear, I am not predicting such a thing. Nor am I saying that things are the worst they could possibly be, not by any means. But I probably don't have to list any specific headlines for you right now to illustrate reasons to be anxious. I know that you already have in your mind a laundry list of your own. I could give you two seconds to come up with the many reasons you might feel dread. So here you go, here's two seconds to fill your mind with contemporary bad news. Now with those in mind, listen to what Jesus tells us. Stand up, raise your heads. Redemption, reconciliation, peace, it's getting closer. In verses 29 to 31, think of a tree, he says. Think of a tree dead in the winter. Now imagine its first sprouts. 
Imagine the buds emerging through the snow. That feeling of renewed hope, have that. And then in verse 34, don't let your hearts get weighed down. Don't drown your hearts. Don't get lost in anxiety. Don't give up. This, it turns out, is not a passage about dread. It's a passage about hope. The editor of Presbyterian Outlook, that same magazine that made room for the sisterhood of the traveling robe, Jill Duffield, asks, what do I need to hear from today's passages, from Jeremiah, from Paul, and the Gospel of Luke? I need a word of hope. I need faith, that assurance of things not yet seen. I need to hear of justice and safety, love and joy, new life and the nearness of God to bolster my faith. I do not hear fear and foreboding so much as a longing for reunion between God and all creation. Upon closer reading, she says, these texts engender not trembling in the face of destruction, but excitement at promise of glorious new life in restored, reconciled community. In recent months, I've been thinking a lot about these things, Duffield names, big words like faith, like hope. A number of us have engaged in conversations about doubt through our fall adult education series. And through that conversation, we have returned again and again to the tendency we have to relegate our faith to something that happens between our ears. Something we either believe in our brains or don't believe in our brains. At times, we think of faith as something we do or do not possess. Something we can have or lose. And we have similar ideas about hope. We have hope or we don't have hope. But hope, like faith, might instead be something we do. Something we do instead of something we have. Less a way of thinking than a way of living. Active hopefulness is particularly pertinent in Advent. In this season, time folds on top of itself. We take these few weeks to prepare for the birth of a Messiah, but also to prepare for the future, for Jesus' return. Paul refers to it as the already and the not yet, right? But it's even more than just a past and future thing, more than just remembering this birth or anticipating a return. Hope mingles among the everyday, the present of this world. Theologian Jürgen Moltmann describes his book, Theology of Hope. He says, with Theology of Hope, I tried to present the Christian hope no longer as such an opium of the beyond but rather as the divine power that makes us alive in this world. Hope is not just holding on to the idea of some great future, an opium of the beyond, as Moltmann puts it. Hope brings us alive to God here and now. So I've been wondering, what are the habits, the lifestyle choices of hope? What are my habits of hope? What are your habits of hope? Gratitude, looking for the helpers, open-mindedness, mystery, communion, coming to table together. Jesus tells us to stand up, to raise our heads, to lift our hearts. Jesus tells us to pay attention. Duffield suggests we be on the lookout for hope, evident in small acts of kindness, simple examples of human connection, slivers of reconciliation among people and nations, tiny hints of green sprouting from branches that represent justice, righteousness, safety, salvation, joy, and love. She gives her own example. She tells a story. On election night last month, I was flying home and waiting for my connecting flight in the bustling Atlanta airport. I sat alone eating my dinner, watching pundits predict outcomes, seeing the breaking news banner when polls closed. I looked forward to being obliviously in the air, 
when definitive numbers were announced. I wondered if my hope for a less politically divided life together was bordering on delusional. Behind me sat a woman working on her laptop. A young man in a janitor's uniform came to empty the trash can adjacent to the woman's table. She struck up a conversation with him. Her accent revealed her home before she told him where she was from, Minnesota. She asked him if he was in school. No, he had to work. He had a son on the way. How exciting, she exclaimed. I'm not gonna try and do her accent, just so you know. <laughs> you have no idea how much your heart will expand. She had an eight -month -old, 18 month old at home, she said. They chatted and eventually she got the young man's name and address so that she could send him baby clothes her son had outgrown. Nothing fancy, she said, but good for every day. He thanked her, told her to have a safe flight. She wished him well, and they went back to their respective work. Duffield says, I got up to go to my gate, but not before stopping to thank the lady with the thick Minnesota accent. I told her I was moved by her kindness. She said, we need to be kind to each other, especially now. Paying attention right where we are might be a habit of hope. I wonder also, though, how we might be called out, called beyond where we already find ourselves, called to wander, whether physically or emotionally, and to put ourselves into the paths of hope, places where there is good evidence hope has showed up before and will show up again. Jesus gives us some practical examples for this. We're called to show up where he showed up, and not coincidentally, where he shows up aren't always the most comfortable spots. He's always finding himself at tables with rabble-rousers and criminals and rejects. He walks with transient people and prostitutes. It's, it's fitting, really, as he himself was born to two wanderers. His early months were spent in the arms of a mother seeking safety for him because of a threat of persecution. Jesus shows us that the places that seem the riskiest the places that make us most vulnerable to heartbreak are, of course, the places where Jesus' kind of hope likes to break through. In recent days, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance has been publishing ways Presbyterians, we, can engage with those seeking asylum at our border. The series has been titled Light in the Darkness, and it connects various events on the ground with practical advice and realistic requests. One of the stories from that is from a group of Presbyterians who are from Nebraska and decided to spend time on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border near Tucson. Their pastor writes about it and the story of being hosted and the generous meals they had and interactions and worship they had. That narrative ends. The U.S.-Mexico border has been in the news a great deal in the past few months. The dominant narrative is one of fear fear of violence, fear of scarcity, fear of the other. A group of seven Nebraskans spent a week on the border and learned a new narrative from precisely the people that we are being told to fear. Instead of violence, we were met with hospitality. Instead of scarcity, we were met with abundance. Instead of being treated like the other, we were treated like brothers and sisters in Christ. Another Presbyterian pastor, Reverend Elizabeth Gibbs Zender, went with a group representing a variety of nonprofits and churches and told her story about the visit with the caravan that has arrived from Honduras. Among her stories about passing out food, setting up coloring stations for a bunch of children, and learning also the facts of the asylum process, she tells about two conversations. One young man told me that his strength comes from knowing that he has made it through difficult situations in the past. Every time it is so hard, and I don't know that I will be able to live through it, but I have, and I am stronger today because of it. Another man told me, he said, she says, it's God's word that helps me when I feel like I want to give up, when I feel absolutely overwhelmed. I just remember, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Then he says, I feel my heart open, and I know that I will be able to get through another day. There are times in our lives when hope seems alive, 
seems easy. Times when unbidden, like grace, it rests lightly on our souls. Or times when it bursts through with eager excitement and wonder. But there are also times when our hearts feel too fragile, when hope seems too dangerous, when we balance the risks and are tempted to close ourselves off. But Jesus reminds us not to give up on hope, to practice habits of hope, to glimpse redemption where we are, to notice Christ's promises alive in the people we're with, and at times to put ourselves into the way of hope, to find the places where God's heart is breaking and then keep an eye out for the light shining through the brokenness. Because the, the light does and will shine in the darkness. We can bravely hope. We can trust our bruised and fragile hearts to God. Stand up and raise your heads. Amen.